came to be buried here. That's the story behind that as well. So anyway, here we are in Down Cathedral. We are very much an active church now. We're still working and playing large parts in the local community. We are uh, and have been since 1846, uh, Church of Ireland or Anglican Cathedral. And this part that you're all in here now, this main body, is what it was when it, in 1846 when it was all refurbished. But there's a bit of a story to tell you all before that. This area that we're in is called the Hill of Down. And for many thousands of years, it has been a place of pilgrimage and worship for people. Way before the time of St. Patrick, there would have been a little settlement here and there would have been little uh, houses to, to house the local people, and there would have always been something going on here. It was known as the Hill of Down because of course it's high up, and when you actually go over to the grave, you will actually see that the area once upon a time was surrounded by marshy land, and you can still see some of that water today. And of course, right over on the right hand side, we have Inch Abbey and the Coy River. So it was a place of safety for those people. But St. Patrick, as I'm sure you know his story, he was captured, taken into slavery up on Slemish Mountain, way up in the north of the country. And that is where he spent his time looking after the sheep on the mountainside, very barren and very lonely for him. Now, luckily for us, he managed to escape and he went over to France. And that is where he worked his way up to become a bishop. After that, then, he went to his home country of Wales. And that is where he had the vision or the dream that told him he needed to return back to <coughs> Ireland. Just take a look here. <coughs> so he made the treacherous journey back here, landed just outside of what would be Dublin, but felt that he needed to travel up north because he felt that's where the people needed him. So he arrived up <coughs> north and just three miles away from here, in the middle of the countryside, he was greeted by an Irish chieftain who actually gifted him a barn. And that is where Patrick made his home and where he spent the rest of his life traveling all around Ireland, spreading Christianity in the country. And we know that he loved Saul. It was his favorite place. And today you're going out there, you're taking the little trip out. So when you leave, Please take one of these little green booklets here. It's just a little bit more about Patrick, but I always like to give out one because it has a lovely little picture of Saul Church as it is today, a little stone church. Of course, it wasn't always like that. A barn would not have lasted. And as I said, it was built in the 1930s to commemorate the 1,500 years of Patrick being here. Now, that place that he landed didn't actually have a name because the name came from the word Saul. Now, Saul is the anglicised version of barn in Gaelic because in Gaelic, the word barn is Saul. So it is named Saul and that's how it got his na its name, the little area. Now, Patrick, as you know, is buried over there. You will see the big stone and the grave. How did he come to be there? Well, it was said that he had a dying wish. And his dying wish was for his body to be put on a cart, to be hooked up to two untamed oxen. They were to be let go. And wherever he ended up, that is where he was to be buried. And it just so happens it was here on the hill of Down. Now, when you go over there today, you will see the big, large granite stone that is there. That was actually put there in 1901 by the Belfast Naturalist Society. And it was put there to protect the area because, believe it or not, when the local people who were emigrating to America and Australia would go along, they would gather up some of the soil 
and take it with them for good luck. So who knows what would have happened if they had have been digging away there all of the years. So the big stone you will see out there just very simply has a Celtic cross on it and you can just vaguely make out the name Patrick. Now, um, I'm going to just diverse a little bit because I'm going to point out the St. Patrick's window, the stained glass window that you will see here in the cathedral. And this is lovely because it tells the story of Patrick himself. On the bottom left-hand panel, you will see him there with the sheep on Slemish Mountain. Then you will see him as an older boy in his brown tunic. You will see him then in his white robes as the bishop but the bottom right hand panel is the important one because you will see Patrick there with two figures beside him dressed in blue. And those two figures are St. Bridget and St. Colum Kill. <laughs> now they are also said to be buried with Patrick. So how did they end up there? Well, in 1183, an Anglo-Norman knight called John de Corsi was coming along and he was conquering this part of the County Down coastline. So he came here to Down Patrick, which was becoming a very uh, busy and, 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 and developing little town. And not to upset the local people, he said that he would reunite Patrick with the saints of Bridget and Colum Kill. So he brought the body of Bridget from Kildare, just outside of Dublin. He brought the body of Colum Kill from the Scottish island of Iona, and they are said to be all buried together to keep the local people happy. <laughs> now there is one little rhyme I would like you to try and remember and take that back home with you. Because it goes, in down, one grave, three saints to fill, Patrick, Bridget, and Colum Kill. And it's a nice little way to remember that. So as I mentioned, we had the very brave, bold knight of John de Courcy. And that he came here, he called the name Down Patrick, the town Down Patrick, which means Patrick's stronghold. And what he did was, this was an Augustinian abbey. So he booted them out and brought in the Benedictines. He brought them in. So the Benedictines were here from 1183, and they lived a very reasonably quiet life, as quiet as they could in that time or that period of history, because there was lots of fighting going on, and people wanted a bit of this land and a bit of this um, pieces of buildings and what have you. So they stayed here right up until the Tudor Wars, when of course Henry VIII reorganised everything. And he then closed down all of the religious buildings, such as the churches, um, cathedrals, monasteries, everything like that. And this building did not escape. And this building lay in ruins for over 200 years. It just became a shell of a building. But luckily, a man called the Marquis of Downshire, very wealthy, and Dean William Ansley, got together and with the very local wealthy people of the area, they decided to refurbish the cathedral. Now, if you look around the walls, you will see these coats of arms. And they were a thank you to the local people who put the money into the refurbishment of the cathedral. And it was eventually opened in 1846 for worship. Now, I also say it's very wonderful because from 1183, parts of the outer walls and this floor date back to 1183. So I often think it must be amazing and it'd be lovely to know how many and who walked on this floor. It really is a piece of history here. But the cathedral itself, now it's quite small for a cathedral, we do know that, but it has some very different and quirky seating arrangements. For example, some of you may not have seen these box pews before. We love these wooden box pews. They're over 200 years old. You have the numbers on the doors where the families would have paid to have their seats. And really, we have no idea why they were built like this, possibly as a nod to the Benedictines who were here before us because they like to pray facing each other. That is one explanation, possibly. 
And down in the back there, underneath our wonderful organ, you will see these lit up stalls. Now they are called our chapter stalls, and they are unique to Irish cathedrals. As you can see, if you have a look inside, they have their nice little uh, separate seating place for them, nice and comfortable. And you will see all of their positions written in Latin, and that is where they would have sat back in those days. Now what actually makes us a cathedral is this wonderful boot. It has the mitre on the top, a lovely seat there, and if you were to sit in that, you would be sitting a foot and a half higher than everybody else because of course it was made for the bishop and he liked to look over all of his people. But this one over here that you will see, there is space for two people. And can anybody tell me what it might have been used for back in the day? No? No ideas? Not a bride and groom? Lots of people no. say that. Lector. A lector? No, because we would have had an old pulpit here. But here's something you won't see anywhere else. This is the judge's seat. Because back in the day, they would have had court sessions here. Because just down English Street, we still have today our courthouse. Beside that we have the little museum, which is where the old jails would have been. And look out for, on the left hand side, two beautiful Georgian townhouses where the judges would have lived. And they would have come here and had petty court sessions. A few other things to look out for, of course, are our beautiful stained glass windows, which date back to the uh, early 1800s. We, of course, have our gorgeous east window here. And I do find it amazing that they could recreate those colours from that time. Mm -hmm. Because um, they were very expensive to make. Um, people joke and ask me when they were last cleaned. And I say I have no idea when they were last cleaned, probably in the 1800s. And maybe why, that, why they've lasted so long, because nobody has bothered to touch them. But they really are beautiful. We also have here a very important piece here of our music. It is the organ. It is one of its kind. It's the only one more or less working and in full working order. You will see there the choir stand on top there. They, they have their choir stalls there. And these gold pipes that you see at the front, they're all overlaid with gold leaf. But I'll tell you a little secret. They're all false. <laughs> they don't make any noise because all of the pipes are inside. It has a little screen and from a door from the side where you can go in and work and clean and see all of the pipes as well. Another little thing to point out are these beautiful capitals, as we call them, at the top of the pillars there. And they date back from the 5th and 6th century. And they were molds that were taken from them then and they depict scenes such as well they have little um, fruit, fruit leaves vine leaves you've got little faces on the on them as well you've got the nuns heads there and little cherubs as well you can see on the wall and on the way in very quickly i'm just going to mention this you would have seen our baptismal font there it's a beautiful piece very original and that was actually uh, has come from Denver's, which is a bar just down the street. But they <laughs> yes, they claim to be the oldest bar in Ireland, dating back to the 1600s. But I'm sure there have been a few before that time. But one evening, uh, Captain Wallace was there. He was a patron of the cathedral. He was having his little drink. He saw this and he knew. He said, that there is the base of an old town cross. So he brought it up here, and today it is used as our baptismal font. So they still did a bit of recycling in those days. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's really all I'm going to say now. Thank you all for coming. Don't forget to lift your little green booklet there. Enjoy Saul, take in the atmosphere there. It really is lovely. And enjoy the rest of your stay here today. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget, just lift yourselves one of the little green books.